a the equivalent of the Dutch uh, Victoria Cross um, to be put onto the standard of the parachute brigade. I was very, very moving, very moving. Are you aware of any British bravery medals awarded to the members of Polish Airborne Brigade following the operations Market Garden? I was not told of any, but I believe that the ones that there were very, there were very few compared compared to the British brigades. We have done a, a little survey of uh, soldiers from 1st Polish Airborne Brigade killed in action, injured in action and missing in action and is in excess of 500 soldiers. They lost 23% uh, of the officer corps and 22% of non-officer corps. From your professional um, judgment point of view, were those heavy losses of 1st Polish Airborne preventable? Um, considering the role uh, of the Poles and what actually what happened, all, everything went wrong. Um, I think that amount of casualties uh, was very high, and to the best of my knowledge, it is higher the casualty rate of the Polish Brigade was higher than any of the others. Major General Urquhart stated in writing that 1st Polish Parachute Brigade Group played a very gallant part in the Battle of Arnhem. Exactly. The name of this brigade would always be linked with the one of the 1st British Airborne Division in connection with this action. Would you agree Good. with this? I, I totally agree and I think it is extremely interesting when you compare with that with Montgomery's sure. um, saying I do not want this brigade which is reluctant to go into battle. Another important contribution to Operation Market Garden was made by Polish Signal Corps which established a radio link between Polish Brigade Headquarters in Driel and Polish Liaison Section in Osterbeek. This radio link was particularly significant in view of tragic failure of the communication of equipment of the 1st British Airborne Division. Yes. I would be very interesting to know more about this. What do you know about this? Well, it's perfectly true. And of course, it was absolutely disgraceful. All the, all the radio communications in 1st Parachute Brigade um, broke down with the possible exception and in the 72 hours we were on the bridge um, the radios were working for about all together lumped together about half an hour just break that up into little bits in the, uh, four days and uh, um, the broke, the uh, communications you can say broke down almost uh, the link was used by the airborne corps the Dorsets and general Dempsey yeah. personally to communicate with general Urquhart it enabled general to call for air support as well as to make detailed final arrangements for the withdrawal of his units. Yes, yes. Therefore, this was absolutely critical. Browning, he was commanding corps. Yes. And uh, it's interesting that all in his book, in his own book, he agreed that the corps uh, was not fit for, the corps organization was not fit for service and he shouldn't have taken it, therefore, to Arnhem in the first case, and in the second case, by taking it, he deprived the first, the first airborne division of, I think it's up to 30 plane loads of guns, anything else you like. Major General Urquhart, a CBE DSO, commander of 1st British Airborne Division, in a letter dated 2nd October 1944 and addressed uh, to the Commander-in-Chief of Polish Forces in Great Britain, express his appreciation of the services of the 1st Polish Independent Parachute Brigade Group, 
which they were under com his command in, uh, in Operation Walker Garden. He then stated that the glider element and men ferried across the river were welcome addition to the already hard-pressed force. They at once came into action and gave us very valuable assistance. You're talking about the men that were pushed over the river Absolutely. by... Uh, by our friends, yes. Sosbowski. Yes. Not only should Sosbowski's um, uh, dismissal be rescinded, but that also he should be awarded the British, um, the British, um, the Victoria Cross. Yes. Um, that, uh, that on the basis that uh, that um, Sosbowski helped. Uh, send the, these reinforcements over at night um, up to his uh, up to his shoulders um, was a very a very brave thing, equal to the um, the award of the Victoria Cross. The letter from General Erhardt uh, of the second of October uh, ends with the words. The losses sustained both before and during the evacuation were heavy. It may, however, be a satisfaction to know that those losses were not in vain and the name of the 1st Polish Independent Parachute Brigade Group will be linked to that of the 1st British Airborne Division in connection with the memorable Battle of Arnhem. Excellent. Major Tony Hibbert introduced me to his very good World War II time friend, Sir Brian Urquhart. Sir Brian Urquhart was the head of the British intelligence at Arnhem in 1944, and since the end of the war he embarked on setting up the United Nations and developing a highly successful career at the UN. Sir Brian implemented the UN peacekeeping concept, introducing the famous UN blue helmets. I have contacted Sir Brian Urquhart, but Sir Brian could not participate in our documentary film in person. However, he has agreed in August 2012 to provide us with a unique but very comprehensive written account of his memories of Arnhem in 1944. To convey Sir Bran Erkat's written memories to film, we choose a qualified military senior officer with an objective Polish and British understanding of the Arnhem 1944 story. I'm Major General John Drevienkiewicz. Uh, I served 35 years in the British Army from uh, 1964 until 2000 and ended up as a Major General. In my last five years in the British Army, I spent more than 30 months uh, in the Balkans uh, taking part in a number of um, Allied operations and coalition operations and so gained first-hand experience of how uh, coalition operations are made to work. My connection with the Polish Parachute Brigade is that my father was a non-commissioned officer in the 1st Battalion of the Polish Parachute Brigade and therefore um, served at Arnhem and Driel. Could you tell us what was your role at the Battle of Arnhem in 1944? I was the Chief Intelligence Officer to the 1st British Airborne Corps. Where did you first meet General Sosobowski and the Polish Brigade? I met General Sosobowski in the summer of 1944. I think I also met him briefly in Nimjegen around the 25th of September when he was about to leave for the United Kingdom. I did not see him in drill. Where were you at the outbreak of the World War II in September 1939? I was in Dorset and I immediately left for Oxford to join up. When did you join the 1st British Airborne Division and what attracted you to it? What was your military rank at the time of Operations Market Garden? I was in the 43rd Wessex Division in Dover during the Battle of Britain. I transferred to the 1st Airborne Division in 1941 because it seemed more active and more interesting and General Browning had asked me to join him. In August 1942, a parachute failure put me in hospital for five months. We went to North Africa from April to September 1943, and then I was posted as an intelligence officer, a major's appointment, to the Major General Airborne Forces, which became the first Airborne Corps in 1944. 
I remained a major until the end of the war. Can you tell us about planning and logistics stages of the Operations Market Garden? In airborne operations, intelligence and logistics are very complicated and vital. Information has to be up to date and seriously assessed. Air photography, military assessments of the enemy intentions, information from the resistance and other sources has to be checked 24 hours a day. Intelligence must be shared and security must be protected. Both optimism and pessimism have to be controlled. Assessments by senior officers have to take account of the confirmed intelligence. How did you evaluate the information on enemy forces and what advice did you give to the Allied Airborne Commander before and during Operations Market Garden? Until I was relieved from my duties, 36 hours before the takeoff for Market Garden, I tried my best to provide an evaluation that included a realistic picture of the constantly changing situation of Market Garden. Some of the elder officers compared the collapse of German morale in 1918 to the Nazi rout in August 1944. I believed that the Nazis were rallying strongly and halting the Allied triumph in Belgium and in the approaches to Antwerp. This would mean that the British 30th Corps would have difficulty in advancing quickly down the road to relieve the 1st British Airborne Division in Arnhem. The move of 9th and 10th German SS divisions in mid-September to the area north of Arnhem seemed to me to be particularly serious. These divisions were a formidable increase to the German forces opposing the 1st Airborne Division's drop zone. The drop zones were eight miles from the bridge, which was our main target. So much of the element of surprise would have been lost. And these were some of the questions I felt had to be discussed. Why was the critical intelligence for Operations Market Garden not acted upon? I don't know. They may have thought that the Nazi opposition would be weak. Some senior officers believed that the 9th and 10th SS divisions had been so knocked about in France that they would not attempt to fight. I thought this was very unlikely, and 1st Airborne Division and the 1st Polish Parachute Brigade would therefore be at a huge disadvantage. Despite the available intelligence, who believed that dropping the lightly armed paratroopers on the two crack SS divisions would be successful? I don't think that Field Marshal Montgomery and perhaps General Browning were thinking along these lines at all. They were concerned with a dramatic surprise that would hasten the end of the war and apparently did not consider the comparative strengths after the initial surprise between the light armoured forces of the 1st Airborne Division and the Polish Parachute Brigade on one side and two crack armoured divisions with their supporting troops on the German side. There was no doubt about the courage and the quality of the Allied troops But the truth was that they were hopelessly outgunned and outnumbered after the first few hours of action. It was a miracle that the Allied troops in and around Arnhem continued to fight for five days for as long as they did. Did the intelligence and the division's commanding officers correctly assess the number of German units, their type and capabilities? As far as I know, the intelligence from all sources was good. I did not know about Enigma at the time, but I assume it was useful to those who were cleared to use it. The problem, as I said earlier on, was that those responsible for the decisions were not willing to face the implications of the intelligence that we gave them. In my case, I strongly disagreed on matters like the drop zones being far too far from the bridge, the importance of the 9th and 10th SS Panzer Divisions, and the Royal Air Force's insistence in only having one sortie on D-Day, on the first day of the operation. I thought that the idea that the Germans were not strong enough to oppose Market Garden was dangerous nonsense. I believe that the plan, therefore, required serious high-level reassessment in view of the latest developments. 
I was dismissed by General Browning on the 15th of September, two days before the operation began, apparently for nervous strain. When and where did you return onto the battlefield? I was ordered to uh, resume my post in the headquarters of the Airborne Corps in Nimiegen on the 23rd of September. What were the problems encountered by the 1st Independent Polish Parachute Brigade at Driel and at the crossing of the Rhine? How did they perform? My account of this part of the, um, uh, of the story is second-hand. The situation